So I would like to share with you something that's actually very exciting to me because data integration is my area of research and uh, uh, this is what we do in my lab. We uh, develop novel methods for data integration. Um, I will share with you, well, we'll go kind of from the clinical data to the omics data to the data integration methods, but um, I will share with you first the kind of the state of the art in these fields and what has been done before and how people have approached this problem and that, what, what we are doing now and where it's all going. And I will also talk a little bit about the survival analysis, just uh, some intuition about uh, doing that because that's a very important part of the kind of data integration and evaluation and um, clinical data. And uh, then you will do hands-on a lot more on that with Lauren. So this is an example of the kind of clinical data that's available uh, regularly. Uh, and it's just a snapshot of a few variables, I suppose. But uh, you will get race, sex, family history, and then the information about what, is, uh, what kind of treatment they have, maybe some of the hormone therapy or the state of the proteins, and uh, uh, stage size. And you also get a lot of information about the, the survival, uh, what it well, first of all, whether it's primary or whether the tumor has recurred, and then all the times that are associated with that. So the time of the original diagnosis, the time, uh, the overall outcome, or the outcome of the disease, right? And these are different because the patient might have died not due to the cancer, but due to other causes. Um, so these two times might be different. And uh, the status of recurrence, and then the time to the recurrence. So they actually a lot of publicly available tools that now take this data and can do inference with it. So this is a PREDICT, it's called PREDICT uh, tool for breast cancer and it's available online for anybody who wants to try. Uh, you put in some of the information about uh, the patient, including the age, the status, uh, some of the um, uh, kind of uh, the chemo regimen, etc., and uh, the, the grade, so the, the information about the tumor and the patient. And what it does is it um, gives you estimates uh, for this patient, how uh, the, the prob probabilities of survival, how likely they are to survive after five years and after 10 years, and what is the benefit of adding different kinds of therapies. Um, and in this case, it looks like the chemo would be beneficial for this patient. Um, I think the reality is that the situation is a lot more complicated, and that's the reason why the, the field of integration came about, is because you cannot, uh, not all the patients with these clinical variables will have exactly the same survival and outcome. And so um, that's uh, the reason why a lot more data is being collected now. So what's being collected uh, for each patient? Well, genetic information. So. Um, uh, now, in uh, clinical genetics labs, uh, I believe in a lot of the, at least, uh, big hospitals, people are collecting at least exomes, sometimes uh, whole genome as well. Um, uh, transcriptome is being collected, also in clinical and in research settings, uh, epigenetic data, usually DNA mutilation, but sometimes some of the epigenetic mark data. Thank you. Um, microRNAs, uh, proteomes, so protein expression. Um, then you have the clinical data that you've had before, but then there's additionally, for some of the diseases, you have additional information such as uh, extensive questionnaires. For neuropsychiatric diseases, you definitely have this information. Um, and I think there was a push to try to ask uh, to have the, this general psychiatric evaluation for a lot of the patients who don't necessarily report because of the psychiatric disease, just to have a kind of a broad understanding of the field and the comorbidities and such. Uh, there is also, of course, imaging data. Again, for neuropsychiatric disorders, it's very common. Um, there's uh, MRI for some of the chronic diseases as well, uh, etc. And uh, finally, especially in the cases such as IBD or things that are related, um, uh, there is diet information that is available. or so this is, I've actually seen all of this data, maybe not for the exact same patient, but for a couple of different cohorts, I have seen all of this data in my lab where 
people come and they say, well, how do we integrate all of this data to make sense, to make it uh, to, to help uh, patients? Some of this data is actually publicly available. Um, so TCGA probably has been mentioned before in this workshop, is, a, is an amazing resource. So this is the Cancer Genome Atlas. And uh, they have now data on 33 different cancers. Over nine cancers have more than 500 patients. And the cool thing is that um, they, have, they have all of these different modalities, right? They have collected this data and stored and made it publicly available. So um, they have the exome uh, data. Um, this one is protected. That's why there is a one. Uh, they have the SNP arrays, they have methylation data, mRNA, microRNA, clinical data, and they also have proteome for 180, uh, uh, 180 190 uh, proteins um, uh, also available for a lot of them, for a lot of these cancers. And I believe that in, in the lab afterwards you will be playing with one of uh, these uh, data sets. So, why do we want to integrate patient data? Anybody wants to say anything? Why would we want to integrate patient data? Why is it not enough to look at their transcriptome if we believe that there is a regulatory problem? Yeah? Well, like you mentioned for IBD, diet, um, you know, you're obviously based to information. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's exactly, yeah? Survival is, is part of the thing. So it's basically, it makes uh, everything that you do um, worthwhile. That's the reason to do it. It, it, it gives us either a diagnostic or a predictive purpose or treatment. So it links it to the reality. Yep. That's, that's exactly right. So actually, a lot of times, at least in the research setting, the question that I've been asked by the clinicians uh, and the um, uh, research scientists to identify subsets of the population that are more similar to each other, right? So we can try to predict the survival based on the general population characteristics, but if we knew that we have exactly the same set of patients with, for whom we already know the outcome, it would be a lot easier to make uh, accurate predictions for this new patient. And so this is one of the ways that this, paper, this data, I don't know why, um, is not necessarily the right question, but uh, what happens with this data and what ultimately people want to do with this integration is, is, um, is exactly is to identify the subsets of patients. It's called disease subtyping and happens very, very, very often. So um, it's exactly, it's, it's kind of leading to exactly the same thing as you said. So uh, identify patients for whom we can predict the tra trajectory of what will happen to them later, how they will respond to drugs, etc. So uh, here's a bit of history. So uh, originally, of course, uh, people have started with small sample sizes and uh, single data type uh, analysis. So if we had, uh, in this particular case, this is a paper from PNAS in 2005. I don't think it's possible to publish in a high-profile journal with 20 cases unless it's a really rare disorder. Um, but um, so GBM is a glioblastoma multiform is a very uh, aggressive and invasive uh, adult brain tumor and it's uh, it's lethal there is the standard of care is temozolomide and which promote, uh, extends people's lives by maybe half a year to a year something like that but they all die um, so this is a um, it's a very important cancer and it has been studied a lot and so uh, for a long time. And um, so this is a standard, essentially a standard pipeline of what uh, has been done then and it's still being done for a lot of the data sets now. So people have collected the gene expression, in this case for 18,000 genes. Um, they selected mostly varied genes essentially because the genes that don't vary across the school population are not likely to be predictive of the difference in the outcomes. Um, they perform hierarchical clustering, and I will show to those of you who have not seen how hierarchical clustering actually works, I will show uh, in a little bit exactly uh, how it happens. Um, they identify clusters for the subset of this, uh, uh, for the population using a subset of the genes. They identify clusters. So here there are two clusters. There's a blue cluster. So every column on the right, you have a heat map. Every column is a patient and every row is a gene. 
and um, it basically shows the clustering diagram. And so here they decided to split up right on top, so you have two different clusters. And you can see that the blue cluster has a very different expression pattern from the orange cluster. Even though they're still quite different between each other, in each of the clusters, they're definitely different, but more different, there's more difference between the two, two clusters. So the way there's a kind of a clinical relevance uh, of these clusters to um, the way that these clusters are evaluated for their clinical uh, relevance is uh, people look at the survival curves. And the survival curves, uh, what they show essentially is that there are two groups. There's a blue group and an orange group. And um, you can actually look at, uh, at this curve and you can say, okay, I have years along the x-axis. I have the probability of survival along the y-axis. And as I go, for example, for year one, how likely is my patient to survive if they were to belong to group two? It's roughly 20%, and if uh, they belong to group one, uh, it's roughly 80%. And so the, uh, what then happens is if a new patient comes in, um, they use this essentially this classifier with the genes that they have selected to predict whether this patient belongs to either group one or group two. And uh, based on that prediction, they say, this is, these are my survival curves, and that's how I can predict and assess whether the patient is uh, uh, sick. So one more thing about these. These are the, the black kind of dots here. Usually they're uh, dashes, uh, vertical dashes. Um, these are sensor observation. It means that the, the information about that patient is no longer available, uh, and it's not known. It's just known that the patient has survived beyond the last point of observation, but uh, it is not known when um, uh, the, the time to actual event is not known for that patient. All right. So what happened after? So this was a single uh, data type analysis type thing. So then uh, the next wave was um, integrative analysis that was based on a single data type. And uh, what happened, so this is a very famous paper from 2010, uh, their heart at all in can cancer cell. They had 200 uh, GBM patients, and they also decided to go with uh, kind of the gene expression as the primary uh, um, basis for decision about the, the clustering in the population. So what they did was they took the mRNA um, and they clustered the patients pretty much in a very similar fashion. And then they said, um, now we will try to either explain or add some of the genes that may be differentiating further between these patients. So uh, these clusters were essentially, these clusters here, um, they were essentially dictated purely by, by gene expression with a few more genes that were uh, looked at for predict their predictive value of these clusters. So, even though they had uh, multiple different modalities of the data, they didn't really use them to uh, make kind of a uh, joint decision. It was uh, primarily driven by a single type. That's why I called it the single data type integration. And so what happened was um, that uh, the paper was hailed because even though there was no real difference in the survival curves, they're shown on the right here, even though there was no difference in survival curves, there was um, uh, the clusters that they have identified, they kind of made biological sense. So they were called this uh, for neural, neural, classical, and mesenchymal groups. And this was based on the genes that were differentiating these clusters from all the rest. Um, yep. Mm, they didn't. No. So this is this uh, this plot I pulled from the supplementary. Uh, th they didn't. They just basically they they talked about the biology of the disease and they talked about how the the importance and they replicated. They had an independent set um, where they kind of identified the same clusters given these genes that are associated with these different subtypes. I think it was 80 genes per cluster. So, and in, in essence, it is, 
it does make sense. I, I've talked a lot to the clinicians about kind of the validity of evaluation by survival data. And it does make sense that um, if the biology of the individual is different, even if uh, the survival is not necessarily different, they might react very differently to treatment. And that's a very important point for a clinician. So the, the biology might dictate the standard of treatment for a specific uh, individual, and that's that's what uh, the the value of this analysis was. So the last, uh, um, no. the most of these mutation analysis that that are done, the somatic mutation, here in these papers, not independently, were uh, kind of associated with a, with the clusters. Not uh, yeah. So interestingly, in this paper, they mentioned that they had methylation data but they didn't find any difference. And so it was me uh, mentioned in passing and as if the methylation data, they didn't, they didn't find any use for it in GBM. And the, there was a paper that came out just two years later where they did a similar analysis, but they let the methylation drive the clustering identification. And these, uh, then they found this uh, hyper methylated cluster. So you can see that it's the, the first kind of band here. Um, is the DNA methylation probes, and most of them are hypermethylated. And um, this is now uh, very well known in the GBM community as uh, IDH1 mutation uh, GBM subgroup. So uh, they looked at these, all of these patients that had the uh, hypermethylation, and they identified that almost all of them, except for one, had this uh, IDH1 mutation. And uh, I think what's interesting is that uh, the same mutation does not give the same hypermethylated uh, status in uh, um, leukemia. In, it's present in leukemia uh, in a lot of patients, but it doesn't give the same hypermethylated profile as it does in GBM. But in GBM, it's a very um, kind of a very significant uh, and very obvious uh, pattern. All right, so, so this, is, this is kind of up until 2012, 13. These were the papers that were coming out uh, uh, in, in clinical literature that had uh, a lot of different types of data that were trying to use them, but using one of the data types to drive the analysis, not, not really doing it jointly. So um, around then in the last five, six years, people started looking at integration approaches. And I will only talk about the three commonly used integration approaches. One is this concatenation and clustering. And this is by far the most commonly used approach by broad uh, and by the TCGA community itself. Uh, the second one is iCluster, which is also quite commonly used right now in the literature. The method came out in 2009, but I think in the cancer community it, was, it started to be used later. And SNF is the similarity network fusion that I will also talk about. That's the method that was developed in my lab that was published in Nature Methods uh, two years ago, which is also now used in TCG analysis by the consortium. So um, the first and the simplest is the concatenation, right? Um, you take the the patient data, and the patients are now rows, the, and you simply concatenate all the measurements that you have for the patient. So it could be uh, gene expression, methylation, it could be clinical imaging, whatever. You can just one big strain, you normalize it. You might want to normalize each of them individually, but uh, later it's just concatenated all together. And um, the only problem that I will mention, and I will do the comparison, show you the comparison between the performance of the methods later. And one thing that you can immediately think about is that the structure intrinsic to the, each of the individual data is kind of lost in this, right? Because you, have, you might have, I don't know, uh, picked 1,000 genes, and you might have picked uh, 15,000 methylation probes, and now you have the signal with kind of unequal strength, but it's also a probe will not be as strong as a, I don't know, a block of 10 genes, right? So it's harder to pick each individual probe as a very important and significant contributor as you would pick like a block of, you have a block of 10 genes that are all strongly correlated. So um, the problem is that the structure of the data set becomes the, the one that is informative of what ha happens with the patients and the biology of the patient becomes very, very uh, different and diluted. And that's, that's part of the problem of the concatenation uh, of this data. 
So, um, as I promised, I will mention the hierarchical clustering. So, this is a, a, essentially a similarity matrix of the six different patients. So, you have patients A through F uh, on the columns and the rows. So, these are the same patients. And the matrix shows how similar they are. So, you could do a correlation, for example, or Euclidean distance between them. And then you say, okay, patient uh, A is uh, similar to patient B with some 0.71. And it doesn't really matter what the actual value is, as long as the relative values are known, right? So, for example, in a minimum distance, uh, also called the single linkage uh, hierarchical clustering, you pick the minimum distance from the whole matrix and you merge those first. So, here you see that um, patients D and F have the smallest distance between them, so you merge them first. The, and they become kind of like a single patient. And then you update the matrix and you go further. So the next patients are likely to be merged uh, um, A and B. And so this is what you see here. This is the, basically in, in this space, the A, B, C, D, E, F, and it shows how similar they are to each other. And on the right, it shows the, the usual hierarchical clustering. You know, so what, what you see here with the height of these merges is uh, which got merged first. So you can judge which, which one was merged first. It's kind of indicative of the distance, right? It's 0.5, 71, etc. So after D and F got merged, this uh, common cluster D, F with E got merged uh, third after A and B got merged, etc. And so A and B, this group was very, very different, and you can see it in this two-dimensional space as well. It was very different from the rest of them, and that's why they got merged and the other ones didn't. And so when this hierarchical clustering happens, you start with every single individual being their own cluster, and you end up with one cluster for all the individuals, right? What's the axis of X and Y? Where? For the, on the left, like Eric is the arbitrary axis. Yeah. 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 Of these points. This is how you calculate how similar you are in space. This is a representation of them. It could be the projection, it could be, is a, like if A is a patient and they had two features, uh, X and Y, this would be the values of those features. So, uh, so this is what happens, and then once, uh, once you group everybody together, you have to decide how many clusters there really are. And this is an internal question, and I have to tell you as a computer scientist that there is no answer to this question. There is no one answer to how many clusters there are. Because depending on what you care about and how you um, kind of formulate your objective of what you care about each cluster to represent, the number of clusters will be different. So it's a natural thing, but it makes everybody's Automation of identifying the cluster is very difficult always. So here are some of the very, very standard uh, procedures. So for hierarchical clustering, people do it by eye, honestly. They most often do it by eye, and I'll show you an example why sometimes it works better than anything else, uh, though it's hard to replicate that analysis um, in an automated fashion again. Uh, then there's a silhouette statistic, which is also very commonly used, but again, it, it has uh, uh, benefits, advantages and disadvantages. Um, eigengap is for spectral clustering, so if you have a graph and you cluster a graph, then eigengap is most commonly used. For spectral, if anybody knows uh, PCA, uh, then uh, eigengap is kind of the coefficients that are associated with each of the vectors, and so you, you pick the biggest difference between the, the vectors and choose that as the number of clusters. And uh, so there, there are many more and there are reviews on all of these uh, different statistics that are used to pick the number of clusters. Uh, these are kind of the most common in this literature, in the literature of cancer subtyping. So silhouette statistic is from 1987, uh, presented first by Russo, and uh, it's, it's very simple. It basically says, um, I'm trying to compare the distances within the cluster versus the different the distances from each of the points in the cluster to all the other clusters, right? And so for each of the points, it can compute this average distance to all, all other SS patterns, but it's essentially points or patients in the other cluster, 
versus bi, which is the difference. So if bi is zero, which means it's really, this point is really close to every other cluster, then you will necessarily have a negative silhouette, which means my point, which is in cluster A, is more similar to cluster B than similar to cluster A. So maybe the clustering was not correct. So it's, it's um, this uh, statistic goes between minus one and one, or uh, metric, goes between minus one and one. So one means it's, a, it's perfect. All of the points that are in my cluster are more similar to each other than to any other point outside the cluster. Um, minus one obviously means everything is reversed, and uh, zero, I guess, it's a borderline. You, you have to look at it. So here's a here's an example. You have uh, uh, there was a there was a paper that looked at four different scenarios, so three clusters in two dimensions, which is represented in uh, picture A. Um, B is the three clusters in ten dimensions, and each cluster has fifty observations. There, there is no possible picture of the 10 dimensions, so uh, no picture for you for B and C. C is the four clusters in 10 dimensions with randomly chosen centers, and D is six cl clusters in two dimensions. And they looked at all kinds of different similarities, but our favorites are here. So silhouette, these this are A, B, C, and D. These are the different scenarios that they had. So uh, silhouette is this green one. And you can see that for point for scenario A, where you kind of had these different clusters, the <coughs> sort of separated in space, which is nice. A lot of the different metrics performed very similarly and performed relatively well. For this D cluster, of course, silhouette would be three clusters, would not be six clusters, right? And uh, the hierarchical clustering, if you did it by eye, and you knew that there were six clusters, you could have pick the six clusters, right? But this is what happens because each of these clusters is easy to tell, but then for each of them to be far away, each each of them are essentially equally far away from everything else. And so there is no no real way to tell that these are all different clusters if we just drop them into, into one cluster. By I would you pick three clusters? Yeah, you would pick three clusters. You you had to have a prior information that there are actually six clusters. Right for this specific right because here you can see colors. If I didn't put colors and just yeah. put this three different in all in one color, you would see the three clusters. Uh, K means which method is that? So K means is uh, kind of it assumes some kind of Gaussianity, <coughs> and so if your clusters do not follow, so here this kind of problem would as easily be solved with K means, but. For k-means, you also have to give the number of clusters. It doesn't pick a number of clusters. It's k-means. It's k. K, you have k centers that you assume that they are, and then you figure out the clustering. There is x-means that was developed in the lab when I worked as a PhD student. It was more than 10 years ago. But uh, uh, there is x-means which kind of just searches over the space and decides how many clusters there really are. But k-means, you have to give the number of clusters a priori. Yeah? Could you, for instance, plot the data beforehand, take a look at it by eye, and then input whatever you think is the best number of clusters? So in cases A and D, where you have two-dimensional data, maybe. But most often, we are not working with two-dimensional data anymore. Right? That's the problem. Yeah. So uh, another important thing, if you ever do this kind of bioinformatics analysis, is to figure out the robustness, right? Usually you um, kind of get a, a sample, and you cluster it, and you say, these are my clusters of the sample, these are my subtypes. But the reality is that a lot of the clustering methods, what they do is they will cluster every single point into some cluster. And maybe, one, maybe some of these points are outliers. They're just far enough from every cluster that by chance they get into some cluster, but it's not meaningful. And it actually destroys statistics a bit, too. So what people have been using, I mean, this method has been published, but everybody has been doing it anyway. Um, uh, this uh, paper in 2003. Um, they published a paper on consensus clustering, which is kind of establishing the robustness of the cluster. So instead of just doing it once and having one clustering, you resample, say, take 80% of your data, 
uh, figure out uh, whether two individuals are in the same cluster or not, and resample again and cluster. Resample and cluster. And you do it hundreds, maybe thousands of times, a thousand iterations, and then you have a matrix of how often patients have appeared in the same cluster, given that they actually had a chance to appear in the same cluster. So essentially this IG is this two patients I and G. MH is how often they have appeared, given that they actually had the chance, right? Maybe they weren't sampled at the same time, so they were not actually in the same sample, so you couldn't they couldn't be in the same cluster, right? So given that they have appeared in the same cluster, given that they were both sampled, uh, did they appear in the same cluster or not? And so what happens is you get this kind of the core of the cluster. You get the core which you roughly believe in. And then you can threshold. You say, I want the patients who 80% of the time appear in the same cluster, and I only trust those. And the rest I simply cannot classify. And so this gives you... Um, more robust statistics about the biology later when you are predicting, uh, trying to figure out which genes are associated with a cluster. You will not be uh, also putting in the values for the patients that are these outliers. You will just be picking this kind of the core of the group. And uh, we basically in my lab, we always uh, do this kind of analysis for the robustness of the, of the clusters. Um, all right, I cluster. I will not talk about it in detail. It's a Bayesian uh, method. It's a. If any of you are familiar with uh, kind of the factor analysis, it's very similar to that. What they do is uh, the intuition behind this method is that you have um, some intrinsic true tumor subtypes. It's, they're Z. They're hidden. They're latent. Uh, they're not known. But because you are working with the same population of patients, it is, it's assumed that the Z is the same for all of these different uh, data modalities that you have. So here you have this Z subtypes, and here you have copy number variation. It's possible that uh, it looks very, very different, but you're constrained to push this, these people, these individuals, into the same clusters as you would have if you had the epigenetic data. So what it does is it does this kind of iterative uh, uh, inference method to figure out which cluster, oh, which clusters there truly are, given all of this data. So this is a truly data integration method where they are not concatenating, but are trying to find this latent space that captures well the structure uh, of all of this data set. So the original analysis in the original paper kind of said um, that um, um, they can capture the complementarity of the data as well uh, in this analysis. But in our experience, when we did a lot of the simulations uh, and tried to run different kinds of methods, we found that it didn't necessarily quite work for complementary data sets. So if you have some complementarity and you want to capture both, it's hard to uh, capture it with this method. So usually, if there's one strong method, say methylation, uh, modality that has strong structure, so for example methylation and others don't necessarily have that structure, it might be driven, this analysis might be driven by the methylation data. So uh, this method, um, almost like a serial supervised cluster? This is unsupervised. This is, unsupervised. This is really unsupervised, yeah. And the reason why it's unsupervised is because at no point do they have any idea about their clusters. They really are trying to find this latent embedding in, in this latent space that they don't see, which is common. So what they do is they try to infer uh, common representation and, pro and simultaneously projections from each of these data sets onto that latent space. So all of them happen at the same time. All of them Some happen at the same time. It's a, it, yeah. Uh, this method was also referred to as interclust in a Curtis Nature paper on breast cancer. I don't know why, but it's the same method. So some of the drawbacks of the methods that we have discussed is that a lot of times they require manual processing, a lot of kind of feature preselection, and um, Sometimes they say, we selected 1,500 most variable features. We can do that, right? But if we have to replicate the analysis done in a paper, if they said, we kind of picked 
this feature for this reason, this feature for this reason, it becomes very, very hard to replicate the analysis. And so this, uh, the more filtering happens, pre-filtering happens before, the harder it is to, to, to use it again in a different context, in some sense. Uh, there are many steps in this pipeline, so there's a lot of filtering, kind of manual curation, maybe picking number of clusters by eye, and so it becomes hard to automate this analysis if you want to uh, have this kind of pipeline in your lab. And um, if uh, most of them, it's true, most of them look at uh, kind of each individual feature, not combinations of features. So if there are combinations of features across um, different data modalities, then it might be lost. So uh, given this, uh, we have uh, proposed a similarity network fusion uh, approach. And this is to integrate data in the patient space. Um, so the first step is to construct patient similarity matrices. I'm missing one slide. So the first step is to construct patient similarity matrices, and the second step is to fuse multiple matrices. So uh, what's a patient similarity matrix? Well, patient similarity matrix is the same as we have seen before. We have a patient by mRNA expression, and it's kind of the same matrix that went into this hierarchical clustering that you saw, right? So this is the, the similarity. We usually use a kind of Euclidean distance here, and the darker the spot, the more similar the patients are, and the lighter the spot, the less similar they are. And so if some of them, um, when you correlate individuals, you will have a lot of close to zero but non-zero similarities. And what, what happens if you essentially zero them out, if you sparsify the matrix, you will have zeros corresponding to no edges and ones correspond, and uh, non-zero edges corresponding to edges in the graph. It's essentially the same thing. It's just a different representation. So this matrix captures exactly what this weighted graph captures. So in this weighted graph, each node is a patient, and each edge represents how similar these patients are. Okay? And so what we do is uh, we construct each, uh, we construct as many of these graphs, or similarity matrices similarly, um, as there are data modalities. So here we have two. And we integrate, integrate them. So the kind of the idea for this integration is a random walk. So everybody's familiar with a random walk on a single graph. You start in one node, you walk around, and you, you come back to the same node. So here, it's a random walk across graphs. So it's a kind of diffusion across graphs. So you start in this node, you, you say, OK, I have a null path here, so it walks somewhere else. But here, I have a path. and so. In every step, in every kind of, and this can be captured by a, a standard matrix multiplication, all the random ones are. And so in this kind of scenario, what happens is that you update this, this graph with the information from this graph, and this graph with the information from this graph. So uh, in an iterative fashion, you start refining each of the graphs to be more similar to each other. And what happens, the byproduct of that is that uh, similarities that are very weak in one of the graphs, they go away. Because they're not supported by another graph, and they were weak to begin with, and they just kind of disappear. So you pull a lot of noise that way. But the ones that are very, very strong, they kind of permeate to other graphs. And so in the end, because in every single step you are guaranteed that the graphs become similar to each other, you are also guaranteed, probably guaranteed, to converge to a single graph which is supported by all of the data that you originally had. So the, the main idea behind this approach was that once we represent each of our individual uh, data modalities with the similarities of patients, we are in the same space, in a patient similarity space. And in the patient similarity space, we can integrate anything, whether it's similarity based on a diet, or similarity based on DNA mutilation, or similarity based on imaging or questionnaire data. And we have actually done it in uh, combining the imaging and genetic data and uh, some of the questionnaire data as well. So um, this, this was the idea, that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't need to be mapped to genes. It doesn't need to be mapped to a common unit. 
you can actually just uh, combine, and you can combine any number of this of these uh, data modalities using this this kind of approach. Okay. So I will show you the experiments. First, I will show you the simulations, and this is primarily for you to to see how the different methods compare on the different kind of scenarios. And then I'll show you some of the results that we had from the TCG uh, data. So uh, we compared methods. We compared concatenation, iCluster, the patient-driven uh, uh, similarity, and the multiple kernel learning. I, the reason why I didn't talk about them is because they're not used as often. Uh, this PDSD method is a very nice method, also a Bayesian kind of uh, latent factor method, but it uh, only works for two different views, so it's not as uh, uh, scalable. I think they had an extension to that. And multiple kernel learning is used a lot in imaging data, but not uh, in this kind of uh, scenario when you want to integrate omics data. So here's one uh, simulation. So the ground truth is here on the left in the middle. This is the ground truth. We have two clusters in this two-dimensional space, uh, and we are trying to identify their uh, identify them from two imperfect views of this, two in imperfect data modalities that are generated. So here, data type 1 and data type 2. And what happens is that we capture pretty well one of the types in, one, in each of the data sets, and we mislabel some of the other ones. So the, the information is only available for one. This is kind of the complementarity. So one of the, the data views contains information about one of the clusters fairly well, in, in the other view, it contains information about the other cluster fairly well. So uh, this is the, the result. So this uh, point is the result. And this is information about how many points were mislabeled, so how many points were swapped between the two clusters. Uh, you can see the green one is the I cluster. The black one is the concatenation. And you can see that as the proportion of swapping goes, uh, goes down, you actually are losing quite a bit of the accuracy if you're doing concatenation. And again, this is due to complete loss of structure when you're getting the data sets. Here's another scenario, also very, very common in biology, in the, in the omics data. Uh, ground truth again is in the middle, but then we add noise to this data. So we add gamma noise in the, in the bottom, and the difference between... And, um, between gamma noise and the standard Gaussian noise, which is on the top, is that it has a tail. So, so it's a skewed type of noise. And so you have the structure of the data captured by both of these imperfect modalities, this data type 1 and data type 2, but uh, the noise patterns are different. And so um, what happens is, um, on the left here is removing this kind of this we are scaling up Gaussian noise, keeping the gamma noise constant, and here we are scaling up Gaussian, uh, gamma noise and keeping the Gaussian constant. So you can see, quite interestingly, that concatenation, it uh, does okay with a low level of gamma noise. Again, the, the tail makes a difference, but as we add more and more noise, it gets progressive, it gets much worse, whereas here it's a lot more stable with the Gaussian noise. It's a kind of a gradual uh, decline. Uh, the other methods, the I cluster performs kind of on par with the other methods. And that's enough, uh, yeah, performs much better. So, with the TCGA uh, data that we had, um, uh, we had five different cancers, and this is somewhat older experience. So, we had uh, fewer patients than I available now. Now it's in the, in the 500. Uh, range for a lot of these cancers, but uh, two years ago it was anywhere between 92 and 215 patients. And one of the, I guess, important points for me working with uh, clinicians and trying to integrate data is uh, they always ask how big of a sample size do you need, how many patients do you need to be able to make the inference. And with uh, the similarity network fusion, we actually don't need as many patients. If there is some signal, we'll be able to find it because it's not it's again, it's in the patient space, not in the uh, feature space. So um, 
we had three data modalities. We had mRNA, methylation, and microRNA for all of these different uh, uh, cancers, the five cancers. So this is the case study of glioblastoma. This is actually the real data. Um, uh, the top is the DNA methylation. So you have both the similarity matrix and the graph that corresponds to that matrix. And you can see that the patterns of similarity between patients is the same set of patients, but the patterns of similarity between these patients is very different in each of these di different data sets. So uh, while it's possible that some of the patients look the same or similar in all of these different data sets, it's actually definitely not the case that it's it's a global kind of similarity. And the question, yeah? Yes, you are right. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, so the graphs, the topology of the graph is based on a, on a joint, on a fusion, so that you could visually compare. But uh, so you shouldn't look at the distribution of the nodes. You should look at the, the edges, and they look quite different. So for example, there is a much stronger similarity between the small cluster and the larger cluster, as opposed to in the mRNA expression, there is a much stronger similarity between much more the kind of the second and third clusters are a lot more similar than the small cluster. You see. The the nodes, uh, the embedding of the node, the representation, the visualization is based on on the the, f the fused network, so that you could actually compare. It's the same. The distribution is exactly the same, so you could compare uh, the edges that are left. So you can see that, uh, based on the DNA methylation, there are still some of the similarities that are left from here because they were very strong. Um, but you can also see that, so here we have the similarity type, uh, which is uh, capturing all the different um, colors that are capturing the similarity of the different uh, patients, uh, patient pairs, within patient pairs. And you can see that majority of them are based on kind of a combination of DNA methylation and mRNA. So this, they both support the similarity between those patients. Or, interestingly, there are some subsets of these yellows, which uh, are mRNA and DNA methylation, uh, and microRNA and DNA methylation. And also there's a, the big pocket of, um, of green, which is a microRNA. And I think what's important is that this black is the one that's supported by all of the data sets. And we actually had to go in and check. And there may be a few edges. There is an edge here. It's hard to check, but if I point it out, maybe you'll see here. There's one here. There are a couple here. But the reality is that majority are supported by two of the data types, but not by all of them. Yeah? And with this approach, are you limited to uh, patients where you have all of the data sets for them? Or like, say you're missing MRI, like so you can we have uh, the follow-up work which we are writing up now so um, it depends on a couple of issues we we looked at I don't know 10 different ways of how to deal with imputation because it, now you are imputing patients mm -hmm. right you're not imputing values per, of a patient anymore like usually the standard uh, scenario in a clinical setting where you have maybe 10% of the data missing per patient and then you um, so in this case you have whole patients missing right and so there are, there are different ways to deal with it and what we basically what we show that if you want to get the same kind of clustering as you would have gotten with the with all of the data if you had all of the data sets the best thing is to kind of impute on the similarity so impute the similarity of the patients rather than imputing the actual values because there are no methods that impute the actual values that actually do it accurately because this is what they do the imputation methods uh, majority of say gene expression it looks like uh, I don't know white white noise it looks like it's all around the same small value except for a few outliers those outliers you have no chance of imputing you have no idea that they these would be outliers so you're basically imputing the mean every time, no matter which method you, you use. And imputing the mean is not very informative for the rest of the, for these values. But uh, yeah, so we, we are kind of proposing a, an idea of how to figure out what imputation method to use given your data, using the subset and kind of 
and simulating the scenario. Okay, and so what we also found was that uh, this small cluster was the IDH1 cluster. So it is possible that one, um, the methylation data still had an effect in our clustering uh, procedure. And this is the one that uh, had better prognosis and was a younger cohort, as, as was known. But what was also interesting is that timozolomide, which is not necessarily... It's, it's a standard of uh, treatment, but it's not necessarily useful. In, it didn't have a difference in any of the groups except for the subtype 1. So in subtype 1, treated and untreated patients actually were, had quite different prognosis than in, in this larger group than in the other two. But yeah? For the IDH1 subtype, how did you, what did you compare them to? Since they're very young, they're probably going to be fairly healthy. They're all going to be treated. So what's the, how big was the group that was untreated with IDH1? I don't, I don't know. I don't think, I mean, we wouldn't have had the significance for two reasons, right? One is that there's no significance with enough data, and another is there's not enough significance with not enough data. So I don't remember if it was the case that we couldn't actually tell with IDH1. Yeah? You, you found out, you found out, first you built the networks, yeah. correct? Yeah. And you found that they had three sub-networks. Then you found out that the smaller one was the IDH yeah. positive one. Yeah, we just checked their mutation status. So you just took the chelation, mRNA, and microRNA, and you found those. Yeah, which is not, it's not hard to, <clears throat> to imagine that that would happen because we had the methylation data, and, and you saw the right. methylation data had a strong signal. So, so but you still have some clustering yeah. on your own yeah. without having put that in. Right, yeah. How, how did these three subtypes match to the other four subtypes you showed us earlier? So the IDH1 uh, mapped fairly well. The other one looked like one of them was mes mesenchymal, but it's, it's uh, I don't know, this. The subtypes are based on the gene expression. If we just clustered gene expression, we would have gotten the subtypes. We are using three different types so, of data. So. Okay, last question. The work graph, yeah. you say... Survival? Yeah, you were talking about whether the most of the mind is effective or not. Yeah. Why, why do you say... Why are you talking about the most of the mind rather than just saying these patients look worse than those? This is this is the group. This is the this is a group based on the treated and untreated in this big cluster. It's not just their survival. It's survival when they were treated versus the it's the group that were treated in red versus the group that were untreated in black. So they did better? The treated ones did better, yeah. Oh, I thought you said they did. Yes, yes. They, di they didn't in, in other groups, so we didn't have enough evidence to say that they were treated, okay, okay. But that, that they did better. Yeah. And this was the case, uh, we kind of did this uh, analysis on the, of the five uh, cancers that we had, the GBM, and you can see on top it's just a regular PCA plot of, um, of the data, and it shows that the cluster separated fairly well uh, in our data, and below you can see the, the survival, and it seemed better, so the survival here was better than using each of the individual data sets independently, uh, data modalities independently. Yeah. All right. Yeah? Yeah, so I, I don't... Yeah. So I don't have this... Uh, this plot, Lauren, do we have anything in the, in the lab for the feature selection, NMI? Not the feature selection, I can add it to the spreadsheet. I don't know. So the way that we did it, I mean, once you get the clusters, you can actually do the usual thing. You can do your t-test. And what, what we actually found, and I'm sorry I didn't have this slide. It would have been interesting um, for, to answer your question, is that uh, the t-test, basically what they do is they look at 
whether the distribution is different in cluster one and in cluster two, but it doesn't correspond to the actual similarities according to all of the features. So it doesn't really capture that intrinsic structure within the cluster. And so the features that were coming out with the usual kind of analysis, ANOVA and t-testing, were not very clean. The features were, were not very differentiating between all the clusters. But when we did something that captured more, so what we did was we had, uh, for each of the features, we looked at how it contributed to, to the clustering itself. So we looked at the uh, mutual information with the clustering normalized mutual information and then the features that we got the top one percent really aligned with the clustering and it actually turned out that there was a microRNA a really strong microRNA uh, signature uh, some of it was seen before and some of it was new yeah so Lauren will talk to you about SNF tool so uh, the the good things about uh, this SNF tool is that um, it, you don't have to do feature preselection at all. You don't have to preselect the, the genes that you will be working with, with unless the signal is very weak. So, for example, if you have one feature that matters out of the 20,000 and you correlate all the 20,000, of course, this feature is not going to matter much to the information about patients. So as long as you have this, the structure of the data is predictive, is associated with a disease, you can capture it without doing the preselection. And um, it's quite scalable. I think we took, looked at uh, 6,000 individuals and it ran within... So the, the integration ran within 10 minutes or so, but uh, the longest time it took to figure out the similarity, matrix, patient similarity for 6,000. It's 6,000 by 6,000 matrix then. All right. So these are... Yeah. They plan to do all the cancer types from TCGA. Why did you choose only five of them? We looked at the biggest ones then when we were doing the analysis. We looked at the biggest ones then. Uh, biggest and no embar embargo. We, we did it in two more cancers, but they had an embargo, and so we didn't pursue them. Those are available to you. Yeah. Yeah, right now we are... Uh, yeah, we are kind of uh, moving on because we are method development people. But, um, yeah. All right. So uh, this kind of concludes the integration, method integration uh, for data integration. And I will switch to survival analysis. So some of you already know it uh, very well. I will just uh, talk about it briefly because it's such an important part of the evaluation of all of these integrative methods that uh, you can't really... Um, it's good to have the intuition behind and then you will do more hands-on work with Lauren. So uh, survival data is characterized by the time to a single event. Uh, I talked about censoring. This is where some of the patient information can be uh, missing. Uh, we assume that this uh, missingness is non-informative. Oh, mouse, sorry. So the non-informative means that it's not that the patients that would that would uh, that are doing worse due to cancer are moving away. So we only uh, we are missing the these patients not at random. We assume that we are missing patients at random due to moves, due to uh, I don't know uh, other reasons. Um, so for uncensored data, we assume that we have actually observed the time of the event. So this is what it kind of looks like. So uh, for the first patient, we definitely have the information. Uh, for the second patient, um, the last observation, the time to the last, the study ended and the patient did not die and there was no follow-up. And so um, we basically know that the patient survived beyond the last, the end of the study. And that's a censored, right censored, right censored information. Um, all right. So it, it happens that there is a lot of uh, censoring in majority of the TCGA data, for example. But more importantly is that there was just very little follow-up. So for people who study, for example, breast cancer and they want 
to perform some analysis like this on breast cancer patient, there is a Metabric uh, data set that is publicly available. You, you have to put some requests, but uh, it's very easy to get. And uh, that actually has a lot of much better clinical data associated with the sample. So there are two important statistics that we'll talk about and mention. There is survival. Uh, that's just the probability of person surviving beyond time x and the hazard rate. Um, this is basically saying, I know that, the, uh, I know that a person was alive at time x. What is, my, what is the probability of this person being alive in, in the next instant? So delta x is going to zero, which means that um, you know, it's essentially x plus a little bit. Just uh, um, the, the next instant, what is the, the, the probability of a person being alive in the next instant, given that I know that they're alive now? All right? So, so it's a rate. That's, that's the difference, what, essentially. What is, what is the range of values of the hazard rate? Uh, for the hazard rate, is it? It can be negative. Um, I, don't, I think it's just continuous. It's just a R. It's just continuous on the R. It takes all real values. So one of the examples of the negative hazard rate, since you asked, is um, uh, that the risk of dying is decreasing as the time goes by. And that happens definitely for infant mortality, for example. That's, a, that's an example where um, babies, when they're just born, are at much higher risk of dying than as, as time goes by. So that's a negative hazard rate. Constant hazard rate is kind of nice. It means no aging. Uh, your probability of surviving at any point is the same as it was before. And it's kind of nice, but usually the kind of the aging process is the prob probability of you dying later is uh, higher. <laughs> it's basically a measure of slope of the um, survival rate. The hazard? The hazard rate. Kind of. It's the probability. Uh, you will see more. You will see more about it. I think it will be more intuitive. But it's the it's the ratio of uh, kind of a observed uh, to what what you have had expected. Yeah. It's it, yeah. It's it's the rate. It's the instantaneous rate in time. What's the probability now, given the, the probability before? I think, I think some of the further examples will be uh, helpful to illustrate this. So Kaplan-Meier estimators go with the Kaplan-Meier curves that I've been showing you before. And these are very uh, commonly used. And it's basically the probability of surviving. So it's what the probability uh, is, um, this is ni is the number of people that are at risk of dying minus all the people that are actually Die, that have actually died at that at time t, right? So this is the survival rate over time, over all time. That's that's why there is a product. Um, so now you know that uh, this is just essentially plotting the the Kaplan Meier curve is essentially plotting the survival rate, and we have already discussed that. So this is exactly what it's plotting. Uh, now we have two survival curves. So previously we had two uh, two groups. We had an orange and a blue group, and now we need to know whether they're really significantly different, or it's the eyes playing tricks on us. And so, um, especially when they're kind of overlapping, it's really hard to tell whether there is significant difference in the survival or not. And so there is a an actual test, a uh, log rank test, which is most commonly used for this purpose. And uh, the summary statistics for these are quite simple. These are the number of people that are at risk in each of the groups and the number of observed events in each of the groups, right? And then what you do is you assume, you basically assume that uh, the, the two curves are the same. This is your null hypothesis, and you work to uh, reject that. So you, if you assume that the two curves are the same, then... Um, the that 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 is captured by the hypergeometric distribution, and then once you know that it's a hypergeometric distribution, you know the mean and the variance of this distribution based on the statistics, uh, the usual uh, analysis. So this is the mean uh, of the hypergeometric distribution, and this is the variance. 
and the test is just a standard normal. So you, you would get chi-square, sometimes it's captured as a chi-square, but that's when you're looking at the actual numbers, the frequencies. These are the, the probabilities. And you can look up the p-value, how well it's, uh, whether, whether it's significant or not, based on the p-value. All right, so this is coming back to the hazard ratio. And this is the hazard ratio for the two groups. And uh, this is, again, this is the number of expected events uh, to the number of uh, expected uh, in, one, in group one versus group two. So if you have a value less than one, for example, that means that the probability, uh, the, the hazard in group one is reduced compared to group two. So it's 43% of, of the risk of group two. If it's greater than one, if it's uh, at group uh, at two, then it means that the risk, the hazard risk of dying or of not responding to treatment, uh, the failure rate in group one is twice the, non the, the failure rate in group two. So, so far you're only dealing with two groups maximum. Yes, that's a good point. So hazard rate, there is an extension to larger number of groups, but it, I've never seen it used. I've only seen it used for pairs. What so the previous test to compare if there's a difference, do you basically just compare them all to each other to find out if there's a There is, uh, so this for the Cox uh, pH model, so this is what people usually use. I will talk about it now. There you can actually look at multiple, multiple uh, markers associated, so multiple biomarkers and multiple groups. When you're looking at the hazard rate and things like that, you only look at pairs. And you can look at all pairs, but then it's hard to summarize sometimes. Yeah. So the, this, is, this is a very, very, another very, very common way to, to uh, assess and to estimate the, Cox, uh, the hazard rate is the Cox proportional hazard model. It's called Cox pH. So if you have multiple variables, this is, this is, you definitely use this when you have multiple variables that you want to assess the risk of uh, on your survival or response to treatment. So the idea is that you have a, this base hazard rate. This is the risk, just a general risk in the, say, population. as like a prior and uh, in a Bayesian sense. And uh, you have an exponential increase or decrease, exponential involved of every other uh, marker increases the hazard if it's, if beta is positive, it's exponential increase in the risk of uh, uh, the individual. So what happens is, uh, so betas, this coefficients for each of the markers, they basically say it represents the log of the hazard ratio increase for one unit of change of each of the markers. Well, the same as e to the beta because of this exponential increase. It's it's the hazard ratio increase per the per unit of change for each of the markers. So if your marker is a gene expression and it changes and it increases, let us say, then the probability the hazard ratio also increases. Uh, the hazard also increases. And if beta, of course, is less, then it means that the risk is decreased with this marker, right? So uh, uh, the, the hazard rate for the two subjects, then it's a, actually quite nice, right? You can see that the hazard rate for two subjects is kind of proportional to this difference between the values of this uh, actual marker, right? So, um, this is, is just a, it's just an example for I just said an example. If you have um, x equals one for the treatment when the treatment is active and zero when the treatment is placebo, then you basically have the hazard rate being eighty percent. It means that twenty percent decrease in mortality if you use treatment versus if you use a placebo. So this is kind of the uh, intuition for the hazard rate. And finally, I want to, uh, when we talk about survival, usually people talk about hazard rates a lot and the survival probability a lot, but they don't talk about concordance index. 
and concordance index, I feel, even though it's a very simple kind of statistic, it's a, con it's a number of concordant pairs. So um, when, you predict, when your model predicts survival for, say, i and j, and your survival of i, you predict it to be uh, greater than survival of j, and in reality it's also true, it means that you are concordant. This pair is concordant with the reality. So if you're... Um, uh, so basically what it means is that your model can order individuals with a, according to their survival information accurately. And I feel like it's a better statistic to use when, um, when you are actually um, trying to, to tell how good your model is. Right? So I want to give you an example um, of uh, using and comparing different models using these two statistics. So the p-value, so uh, this is the Metabric uh, cohort that I mentioned. This is breast cancer, and they had CNV and expression data. They now have more. They definitely have microRNA data. They have a little bit of the exome. I think they have uh, selected a few genes to sequence, actually. And uh, they might have methylation data by now as well. And they had almost a, uh, almost a thousand patients in the discovery cohort and about a thousand in the validation cohort. And so it, it's a very rich data set. And as I said, it has a much better follow-up than the TCGA data. And so the PAM50 is a clinically approved um, uh, classifier. It's a 50 genes that are characterizing, uh, that are uh, putting people into different clusters. So. Pam, Pam 50, I just heard a talk by the guy who, who actually invented this uh, signature, and it took him 13 years to move it from the lab where they discovered it to the clinic. That was very depressing. Um, and so this is Pam 50, and they assume that there are five subtypes in breast cancer. And uh, this is the I cluster, which was called Interclass in that Nature paper. And they said that in breast cancer, there are 10. Uh, clusters and they uh, associated some of them with uh, amplifications and others with a high different expression. Um, and this is SNF. And so we said we don't know how many subtypes there truly are. So we tried, we constructed the network and we partitioned it into five clusters and ten clusters. And what you can see is on top you have the p values for the discovery and the validation of the Cox pH model. So you will see in your lab how you get these p-values for, for your model. So basically what this says is that um, the survival in one of the groups, the curves, is definitely significantly different from the curve in another group. And of course there are biases. If you have a very small group, then the p-value can vary significantly, greatly, and so it's much less reliable. But barring that, um, you can see that the difference this, this kind of in p-values, there is, they all look significant, all of them, right? According to the concordance index, so this is the ability of the um, model to order individuals by survival. Um, the I cluster did a lot better, but also they had more more clusters, and SNF did a, a little bit better than I cluster, but it was basically the same for five clusters or ten clusters. So what it says is that our ability to order people with respect to their survival is limited when we are starting to cluster the data. So what we uh, we were asked, uh, this was a, one of the reviews of our paper, we were asked uh, how many subtypes are there really in breast cancer? Can you answer that question? And so what we what we said is that maybe there are no it's not a fixed number. The more patients you'll see, you see thousands of patients, the more it'll look like it's a bit of a gradient. And so what we proposed was to not do the usual kind of the what is currently done, take a new patient, put them into a subtype even though they don't quite fit, and then use the survival associated with that subtype, but to take a patient, integrate them into a network, and then predict the survival for that patient using the whole network. And the difference between this previous approach and a new approach 
the previous approach with the clustering, it kind of says, okay, I assume that my patient is similar to all of this, this little group of patients that I have seen that are in the subtype. What the network does, it actually says, first of all, I have the weights of how similar and how different, so it's a lot more continuous scale, but also I know who my patient is not similar to, and I can use that information. And in clustering, you kind of don't use that. And so what we said is that we... It's a slight uh, change in regularization for the Cox network, for the Cox pH model. But uh, the point is, when you use the network and you use the weights that we estimated uh, of the similarity between these patients, you get a much better uh, ability to order patients with respect to survival than the same network, but when it's kind of clustered into smaller subtypes. So it's it's kind of a discrete version of a variable versus a continuous version of a variable. And so um, basically what we are saying, and especially when we deal with neuropsychiatric disorders and things like that, when it's a clear spectrum, when it's, a, it's really not obvious that there are these very, very different subtypes that maybe it's used, more useful to represent things as a network and try to use the whole network, information that's encoded on the whole network. What do you mean exactly when you say ordering patients by survival. So when you build a model and you are trying to assess the quality of the model, you say, did I predict the ordering of the two patients correctly? I already know their survival. Did I order them correctly? Did I did my model predict survival of one being better than the survival of the other? Yeah. Um, how, can you how do you actually compare different clustering concordance index other than just looking at the, at the numbers? Is there like a p value you can generate? Because if you, if you even look at stage and grade and your concordance index for some models is like 0.7, and then you do a fancy clustering with genetic information like up to 0.71, and it looks higher, but is that really? either statistically significant or also clinically significant. So concordance is just another statistics that com comes out of the of your Cox pH model. So you can get that. It's it's associated with a p value which is already associated with a Cox pH. But if you compare one model to the other model. I know it it goes up and you don't know whether this going up is significant. This, uh, you evaluate the whole model. So this is yet another statistic, but you already have a p-value for that model, and so you can use that p-value you like from your Cox pH. versus 0.74 in your discovery I understand. cohort, if you had different patients or different characteristics in your validation cohort, could it be also reversed? Yeah. Okay. What I'm saying is that concordance index is not, is one of the statistics. You can't just look at the concordance index and say, this is this is good enough. It's just another way to evaluate your performance or your clustering. Yep. So uh, for the data integration uh, in in my field, for example, one of them is uh, trying to figure out the actual what the question was about pathways and association and everything. So try not just to get the the pathway as a gene, but to figure out uh, how the methylation and the gene expression and the microRNA, how, uh, whether there is a mechanism uh, called, that is associated with a specific cluster. So it's a kind of a feature integration, measurement integration uh, idea uh, at the same time as the data integration. So that would be nice, and that's not available right now. Um, uh, there is another kind of venue where we are going with this is trying to predict a response to different treatments for patients, right? So if we have a patient and we want to, uh, and we have a basket trial, which, which is the best treatment to give to the patient? Um, so if we have that kind of question, it's possible that for one of the drugs, it, at least with respect to the network approach, for one of the drugs, you need to compare according to one pathway. But uh, for another drug, you need to compare patients according to a different pathway. So how do we kind of build uh, that in uh, dynamically. Um, so this is all from me. It says we are on coffee break and networking session. Um, but uh, I would be happy to take uh, questions more quickly.
producing uh, in the months that it's supervised and only the target plants? Well, this is the with with respect to the drug response. Yeah, we actually we actually tried this, and it seems that if there is strong signal in the data, we can do as well with unsupervised methods as we do with supervised methods. But it always scares me because I think supervised methods should do better. Yeah. Question: When for the brain tumors, you had the three of networks. Mm -hmm. Do you build each network independently no, no. first? No. Oh, no, it, it's one it's one network and we can cluster that network. So in that case we use uh, So if you do them separately by MRNA and manipulation whatever, do you get a similar looking network if you do them on their own? I will put the appropriate this. So the for this particular approach, you build the network independently for each of the individual data modalities first. This is the so you do do that first and they do look different and you would get different clustering. It's just it's actually yeah, but it's actually interesting. <clears throat> We're doing some work with Lawrence, and it seems that where it matters is actually the borderline cases. The cases where um, gene expression would put in one cluster and, and methylation would put in another cluster. And so their integration really can be informative. Where, because for some of the core clusters, there are some patients that are so different from other patients that you could use just gene expression or just methylation to put them into that. Um, so to identify the, that subtype. So why are the, why is the topology similar but the edges not? The topology is uh, similar by design. It's, it's put there because otherwise you couldn't tell of how similar or different they are. If we change the, the position of the nodes as well, it would be impossible to compare visually, right? This is a visual aid. So the topology is just a visual aid? Yes, yes. No. For in here, it doesn't. It's uh, the topology. Yeah, the topology is based from the fuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end, how do you do your survival analysis for the network model for your last slides? So it's the same. We do eigen gap or silhouette. We figure out which clusters they are, and then it's the same way as you would do for any. S you you already have your subtype, and your patients. You don't put one patient in one cluster since you divided them into the entire network. So how do you? Oh, you mean the very very last yeah. result for the network? Yeah. So we actually do not. Yeah, we do not cluster at all for the network. We actually edit the regularization term, uh, where. Uh, it's just a, a small appendage to the uh, to the Cox model. I don't have the formulas here, but uh, you basically add a small uh, regularization, which is essentially the weights. It looks at the weights between the two different patients, and so you add. It's like a penalty for patients who are far. You will get a higher weight, a higher penalty. To have the same result outcome, so it's, a, it's essentially it's a predictive model. It's a regression with a penalty for the weights between weight samples. It's it's the same network. It's this network. I mean, this is glioblastoma network, but it's a it's a it's it's a network. So you can look at the weights. We, no, in terms of a or something like that, you can't really build a No, you can't. No. There's no way. You, you would just have a list of all patients with their survival. <laughs> I don't know if it could be useful visually. But it's made for the regression, basically. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just a mathematical, yeah. Yeah, it's just a, just a change in the regression slightly. Yeah? When you show one of your NAS um, graphs, you show that your network gives you um, a C value of around 27 compared to the accepted, well, the one that's commercialized or whatever. 
Just saying that you can order the individuals better with survival. It just that the model, if you don't actually subtype the patients, a new patient comes in and you try to predict their survival based on the existing network, you will get. Uh, yeah, but that difference, 0.56 to 0.7, is that, is that a big difference or a small difference? Or I see. So that's the same kind of question as uh, was asked. Uh, Would it make a huge key yeah. difference? No, it won't make a huge clinical difference. I don't know what's a huge clinical difference. In classifying patients when they come. Yeah, to yeah. Yeah. Right, but it's still only 70 70 percent uh, characterized correctly. So for the individual patient, we don't know how likely we are to get each individual patient correct. Well, I mean, we know 70 percent. So. It definitely makes a difference. 70, 72 percent being being able to order seventy two pairs correctly versus fifty six percent of the pairs is a is a big difference. Yes, we are able to predict the survival to order people with respect to their survival better now. But that sounds like a huge difference for both population. It's it's a difference. I don't know. There is no statistical test like we discussed. There is no statistical it, test associated with it. Because it's just better than random chance. It's slightly better, right? But it's better than, than what was before, which was nothing. Are there further questions? More questions? Fewer questions? <laughs> no? Okay. Then thank you.